Welcome to the 10th webinar of the Carnegie Knowledge Network on value-added methods and applications. Today we have the question, what do you know about the use of value-added measures for principal evaluation? My name is Jeannie Myung. I'm the director of the Carnegie Knowledge Network, and I will be the moderator for this webinar. We are delighted to have with us Susanna Loeb, who will be talking about how principals influence the outcomes and what to consider when thinking about using test scores to assess principals. By way of background, uh, the Foundation launched the CKN in response to the disconnect between rapidly accumulating technical research on value-added measures and design of accountability systems using these measures. We sought to create a mechanism by which relevant research findings could be translated to inform the design and administration of evaluation systems. Features distinguish the work of the CKN from other research products. We only respond to issues practitioners raise, but we also actively engage a community of practitioners in the development of the content. The Fonagy panelists, of which Susanna is one, represent the highest level of technical expertise from a range of perspectives with commercial interests around specific modeling approaches. Within the panel, we build scholarly consensus from what is a complex and often fragmented research base. Finally, we seek to inform prudent action in policy and practice. We will hear a presentation from Susanna Loeb, professor at Stanford University, where she's also the faculty director of the Center for Education Policy Analysis and a co-director of PACE, Policy Analysis, policy analysis for California Education. Um, several other notable positions and accomplishments, she was recently appointed by President Obama as a member of the Board of Directors of the National Board for Education Sciences. She is known for her research on teacher supermarkets and and she also contributed to the research based on principal effectiveness. We'll hear a bit about that research. With Jason Grissom, she has authored a Carnegie Knowledge Brief pertaining to the use of value added for principal evaluation. Find the PDF of that document on the CKN website. In one, Susanna will give an approximately 20-minute overview presentation of key findings from that brief. In the time that follows, she will respond to questions you may have. Please the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen to send questions to me, which I will then pose to Susanna. Feel free to send your questions at any time during the presentation. I'll mention that the slides and audio will be made available after this webinar. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to you, Susanna. Jeannie, um, and thank all of you for coming today. As you mentioned, I'm going to talk if I can get control over the slides. <laughs> Let's see if I can do that. There we go. Uh, as Jeannie mentioned, I'm going to talk about the brief that I wrote with Jason Grissom called What Do We Know About the Use of Value-Added Measures for Principal Evaluation? So we all know that principals play a central role in how well schools perform. They're responsible for establishing school goals and develop strategies to meet them. They lead their school's instructional program, recruit retain teachers, maintain the school climate, and they allocate resources. So how well they execute these functions affects their school and their students. Principles are also central to many of the current policy approaches uh, that give schools greater autonomy to respond to accountability goals. And within school choice programs, uh, the principals have autonomy to uh, respond to family interests. Uh, this importance of school leadership has led to an interest in understanding principal effectiveness and improvement. In response, policy uh, policymakers have developed accountability policies aimed at boosting principal performance, and they are increasingly interested in evaluating school administrators based in part on student performance on standardized tests. So, for example, a bill in 2011 requiring that at least 50% of every school administrator's evaluation be based on student achievement growth as measured by state assessments, and that these evaluations factor into principal compensation. New York and Louisiana have similar policies. And partly as a result of these laws, many districts are trying to create value-added measures for principals, much like they, uh, those they use for teachers. While a large liter literature assessing value-added measures of effectiveness for teachers, the research on these measures for principal evaluation is much, much smaller. In thinking about how to use test scores for assessing principals, 
we might ask, aren't uh, principal issues just like teacher issues? And in some ways, they are. We know from the research on teacher value added that which test matters, for example. Teachers who look good on value added measured by student performance on one test do not necessarily look good on value added measures based on another test. And this, this is likely to be true for principals as well. For teacher value added measures, we need to be careful to adjust assessments for characteristics of students they teach, things like their prior test performance, whether they're English language learners. We'll have to do this as well for principals, or our, our estimates will be biased. But even more important than bias for teachers is the imprecision of the value added measures, driven by measurement error in the test or small numbers of students in the classroom and possibly by idiosyncratic things that happen during the year that are outside of the, the, the teacher's control. And this means that the measures might be accurate for measuring the average of a group of similar teachers, but they'll not be as ab accurate for each individual teacher. And we'll definitely need to think about this imprecision for measuring principal value added as well. However, there are also important ways in which principals are different than teachers when thinking about using student test scores to create performance measures. And it simply comes from the fact that principals' jobs are just different than teachers' jobs. Um, as an example, principals affect students over an entire school year. They don't just affect a student when they, they're in a single grade. And as a result, the principal can affect a, the same student in more than one year. Even more importantly, maybe, while principals directly influence their students in the classroom, the principal's effect are indirect. For example, working through hiring good teachers or helping good teachers improve. And many of the resources through which principals might affect students are partly under the principal's control, but partly not under the principal's control. And we have to take that into account. It's also a bit easier to find a group of teachers who are in a similar situation teaching similar students um, so that we can compare them in value-added measures. It's more difficult to find a group of principals who are serving in similar situations. For example, in, for teachers, we can compare within the same school te teaching third grade, all the teachers teaching third grade in a school, but there's only one principal who works at a school at a given time. So we, we don't have the ability to do that. And these differences between teachers and principals points to the importance of understanding how principals affect students when you're going to choose how to create the value added measures. So we don't really understand the process by which teachers Losing control of something. Uh, which teachers affect students? They teach directly, or they create uh, learning environments directly for their students. The process for principals is much less clear. Choose are particularly uh, important to consider here. The first is the time span over which the principal's decisions affect students. For instance, you might think it's a, a reasonable question how much of an impact a principal will have in their first year in the school, given the likelihood that most of the staff were there the, before the principal arrived and are accustomed to doing things in uh, the way that it's been done in the past. If you consider a principal who's hired to lead a low-performing school, suppose this principal excels from the start, how quickly would you ex expect that excellent performance to be reflected in student outcomes? And I think the, the answer depends on the ways in which principals impact students. If the effects are realized through better teacher assignment or some kind of encouraging or incentivizing students to exert more effort, then, then you might see those effects reflected in student performance immediately. But if, on the other hand, a principal makes her mark through longer-term changes, such as hiring better teachers or creating environments that encourage effective teachers to stay, it could take years before her influence is reflected in student outcomes. And in fact, these principals are likely to have both these immediate and long-term effects. The second consideration is what does the principal have control over and what don't they have control over. And it's, it's important to distinguish principal's effects from characteristics of schools that lie outside the principal's control. It may be that the vast majority of a school effect, how good a school is, um, aside from those associated with which students go to the school, is just attributable to principal's performance. So principals should be held responsible for this. In this case, identifying the overall school effect is enough to identify the principal effect.
But alternatively, school factors outside the principal's control may be important for school effectiveness. For example, uh, if a principal has little control over faculty selection, uh, one means of improving a school, hiring good people, would be outside of the principal's control, though the principal could still influence the development of teachers in the school and the retention of good teachers. And they, it's not, not that they wouldn't have any effect, but if the goal is to identify principal effectiveness, it's going to be important to net out the effects of faculty that affect school effectiveness but are outside the principal's control. One thinks about these two theoretical issues, um, the time of the principal effect and the extent of the principal's influence over schools has direct implications for how we should estimate value added for principals. Uh, at least three possible approaches stem from thinking about these issues, and I'm going to go through through each of them. Just as an example, there are other ones as well, but I think but these capture most of the variability and different things that, that, that you might want to consider having to do with time span and domain of control. So first, let's consider the, the simplest case. Assume a principal's effect on the school uh, is immediate, and they have control over all aspects of the school. Then teacher effectiveness, I mean, the principal effectiveness and school effectiveness would essentially be synonymous. They're the same thing. The case here is essentially the same as the one used for teachers. We assume that teachers have immediate effects on students during the year they have them, so that we take students' growth during that year, controlling for various factors as a measure of the teacher's impact. For principal, any growth in student learning that's different than would be predicted by the student characteristic should be attributed to the principal in, in this most simple case. This um, approach has some validity for teachers because teachers have direct and individual influence on students, but the face validity of this approach for principals is not that strong. The effectiveness of a school may be in part due to a principal. It may also result from factors um, in place before the principal took over. And so this misattribution of school effects that are outside of the principal's control can create bias in the estimates of principal effectiveness. One alternative is to compare the effectiveness of a school during one principal's tenure to the effectiveness of that same school at other times. The principal would then be judged relative to how much students learn when he or she is there relative to how much students learn when other, when other people were in charge of the school. And this is the second approach of, of measuring uh, principal value added, and I'm going to call it relative school effectiveness. We'll assume that the principal affects the school immediately, but we don't assume that they control everything about the school. Principal effectiveness here, again, sorry, should have better control over these things. Effectiveness of here equals this school effectiveness relative to other principals who have led the same school. In some ways, this approach seems more valid than a f the first approach because it compares principals in similar situations. However, there are serious drawbacks. The first is simply that schools change, so a terrific set of teachers could retire. So we have to take account of these changes, and taking account of changes in a school over time may be very similar to comparing principals who are serving in different schools. But I think even more importantly, um, given a small number of principals that schools have over a period of available data, the comparison set can be teeny, and as a result, kind of idiosyncratic in this uh, approach. In the available data, there's only one principal in the school. There's no way to use this approach because there's nobody for, for whom we co can compare the principal. But if there's only one or two other principals, you're just comparing to such a small number that you're not really sure that this is really an accurate way. So that's the second approach, which has some kind of, it has a nice feeling over the first approach, but some clear drawbacks. So far, we've considered models built on the assumption that the principal performance kind of comes in when the principal's there, it's reflected immediately in student outcomes, and it's constant over time. It's likely more realistic that principals take time to make their mark and that their impact builds the longer they lead the school. 
improvement comes from building a more productive working environment, and it may take the principal a number of years to get this to happen. So a third approach assumes that the principal takes time to do this, and it's essentially equating principal effectiveness to school improvement. So instead of saying how good the school is when the principal is there, you say how much does the school improve while the principal is at the school. And again, the appeal of the approach is its, its clear kind of face validity. It makes sense that good principals improve schools over time. However, it, it also, of course, has disadvantages. And the first is that there's still some concerns with bias if the school was already improving and the principal is just taking over an improving school, so it continues. So that's one possible uh, problem. But really more importantly in this approach is that you need to measure changes in effectiveness. And measuring effectiveness is, itself has a lot of error associated. And when you're, make, when you're measuring change in two things that have error, you've got even more error. So we're not quite sure until we look empirically whether there is, uh, it's just going to be too much error to really get any real signal of effectiveness when you start to look at improvement. So, so far, all of this is to say that there are multiple possible approaches to me measuring principal value added that differ in their assumptions about the timing and the domains of control for principals. And we've looked at measures of school effectiveness, of, of relative school effectiveness, and at, at measures of school improvement. And these three approaches are each based on conceptually different models of principal's effect, and each will lead to different concerns about bias and about precision. So, what is it that we know about these so far? What is the current state of knowledge on this issue? Well, generally, it is not so great. There is far more knowledge about teacher value-added measures. Moreover, most of teachers' value-added are based on shared conceptions about the effect of teachers and their students. By contrast, the value-added measures for principals can vary both in their statistical approach and really in their underlying um, logic. There's one study from Florida that compares value-added models based on the three conceptual uh, approaches to principal effects that I just uh, talked about. And uh, there are a number of results of these analyses that I was thinking it, that it was uh, worth going through. And the first really is that the model matters a lot. First, the model matters for which principles look good. Killer models that are based on school improvement, the one that I see might be difficult to measure because of all the error, tend not to be correlated at all with models based on school effectiveness or relative school effectiveness. And that means that a principal who ranks high in model of school effectiveness is no more or less likely to rank high in models. Oh, the ones who, who rank high in school improvement don't rank high necessarily. They might rank high, they might rank low in models of school effectiveness. Um, or models of relative school effectiveness. The difference between whether you compare principles between schools or within the same school um, aren't as big, but they, there are still differences there. That's the first thing, is that models matter for which principles look good. Models actually also matter for how important it just looks like it is, uh, which principle you get. So is there a big difference in being a school with one principle than another? The, the improvement model that it can, may have a bunch of measurement error in it doesn't look like principles are very important, um, but the other two models make them look much more important. If you hear the other two models, the one where you look between schools versus the one where you look within schools, the one where you look within schools, the principles look much less important than the one you look between schools. And there was a study in North Carolina found that there was about a four, you look, principles look four times as important in the one that looks between schools. But that's that surprising because the one that looks between schools hasn't taken out all the differences across schools, which is what that second model has done. So models matter not only for which principle looks good, but just for um, uh, how important principles look overall. Finally, there are important feasibility differences across the approaches, and I, I touched on this a little when we were discussing that. So first, if you consider a model that compares principles to other principles that served in the same school, the, the approach requires that you have at least two principles serving in the school over the time of your data. 
in most places, that can eliminate a lot of principles because you just the the same principle will be in the school the whole time. So whether or not you have enough uh, principles in the school, if you have a long enough sample, um, do this is is questionable. So it may not be feasible to do that one for for many. Um, any principles. And similarly, if you're looking at the model of school improvement, you need the principal to be in the school for a good amount of time because, I mean, because you're measuring improvement. So if you're measuring improvement, um, just you can't measure it clearly in one year, but even in two years, it's hard to measure improvement. So this is to say that the basic model, the simplest model, it really, we don't like it very much because we worry that a lot is being left out, but can measure it for everybody because it's simply school effectiveness, while these other two models are much less feasible for many of the principles. Okay. To better understand the differences in the, in the value-added measures based on different approaches, one study compared different value-added measures to a set of other measures, including things like the district's rating of principals, uh, the, the student, parents, and staff assessments of the school and of principals. And these comparisons show no relationship between all these other measures and the measure of principal value added based on school improvement. So even though, again, it, it seems like we should measure principles' effect by the improvement of principles over time, it's, it appears to be very difficult to do because there's just so much error in doing it that it's not related to any of the other kinds of measures of, of principles' assessments, including a district's evaluation of the principles. The first and the simplest approach has the greatest relationship with um, of those other the the other measures. The implications of these results, uh, where we see that the simplest measure, the school effectiveness measure, is really highly correlated with things like the district's evaluation of principals and the assistance evaluation of the principal, may seem to point to that being the best measure of these three approaches to principal effectiveness. The problem is, is that they may also, the, the, the district and the assistant principal may be looking at the effectiveness of the school in evaluating the principal and not really on what the principal is doing to change things. So while it might be seen as validating the first one, really we just don't know whether all of the measures are weak in this way or whether it is, uh, or whether that initial measure is really um, better. So in sum, there are important trade-offs among the different modeling approaches. The school improvement approach is conceptually appealing, but it doesn't cover all participants, and it seems um, too imprecise to be useful. The school effectiveness relative to other principals who have worked in the same school has some conceptual appeal because it takes out some of the things that a principal wouldn't have control over, uh, but it can't be done on the full group of principals. Um, and plus, it has more imprecision than the simplest model. The SIS model, essentially school effectiveness, isn't conceptually appealing because the principal doesn't control everything, but it's clearly the most accurate. Um, it's a relatively accurate measure of school effectiveness, and it's certainly the most predictive of other measures. So that's kind of the current state of the knowledge. Of knowledge and then the question is, well, where do we go from here? So given the small state of research, <laughs> it's not surprising that there's a lot more to know about principal value add. Using student test scores to measure principal performance faces many of the same difficulties as using them to measure teacher performance. And we need similar additional research for principal value added as we do for teacher value added. For example, it would be useful to understand uh, to the extent to which principals who look good on one measure look good on another measure based on different kinds of student test performance and which kinds of test performance provide the kinds of in information about teacher and principal effectiveness that we really want to know. If the, if the measures based on different um, if the value-added measures based on different tests are inconsistent, it's going to be particularly 
important, choose outcome measures for students that are really valued. Also, challenges to using test scores to me measure principal effectiveness that differ from those associated with using these measures for teachers. Challenges also could benefit from additional research. In particular, a better understanding of how principals affect schools would be helpful. For example, do principals affect students primarily through the composition of their staffs, or can they affect students regardless of the staff with new curricular programs or better assignments to teachers? Um, it, but having clearer answers to these questions, it could point us to the most appropriate ways of creating value-added measures. For no matter how much we learn about the ways principals affect students, value-added measures for these educators are going to be imperfect. They'll probably be both biased and imprecise in some ways. Given these imperfections, I think research can help us to understand whether and if so how these value-added measures can be used productively, even though they have some of these shortcomings. As do many managers, principals perform much of their work away from the direct observation of their employers. And as a result, the, the district leadership need mem measures of performance other than observation because they're not there all the time. Which can clarify where the use of value-added measures improve outcomes and other measures in combination with or instead of value-added lead to better results. There's now very little empirical evidence to warrant the use of value-added data to evaluate principles, just as there's very little evidence against it. We just don't know whether it's useful or not. The final job for this brief was to think about what can't be resolved by empirical evidence, and that is, of course, a large list as well. Uh, the usefulness of value-added measures are going to depend on what alternative measures are available. It isn't possible for researchers to give evidence on whether value-added is better than what's available for each district or each school, and it will be important to assess value-added for in, in each situation in light of the capacity of the institution to collect alternative measures. The brief has also highlighted many of the potential flaws in principal value-added measures, pointing to the potential benefits of additional or alternative measures, but we don't have great information on those either. Um, one set of measures could ensure other student outcomes like attendance or engagement, and we could use that in much the same way, or another set might um, directly gauge principal's actions. Are there certain actions that the district would really like uh, principals to do? These kind of measures might come from feedback from teachers or parents or students and from a combination of observations and discussions between district leaders and principals. Research can say very little about how to balance all these different types of measures and which type of measures are feasible to collect uh, in each situation. But whether to use value added and what other measures to use will depend on local ability to collect and process different measures as well as the need for evaluation. And it may not evaluation may be very important in the district or may not be that important at all. In conclusion, the inconsistencies and drawbacks of principal value added measures lead to questions about whether they should be used at all. They're not accurate as measures of effectiveness. They lack reasonable validity when calculated simply by school effectiveness, which is similar to how teacher value added is calculated. Um, alternative measures, while conceptually more appealing, are, are worse for other reasons. However, theoretically, if student has performance in an outcome, uh, uh, if student test performance is an outcome, they care about, then the system should use test performance in some ways to assess schools and to hold personnel accountable, if no other reason than to signal the, the importance placed on this outcome or other outcome. Unfortunately, we don't have evidence about how to do this as well. Remember, while value-added measures of principal effectiveness are clearly imperfect, so are some of the other widely collected measures, such as district staff assessments of principals, which here again more tied to school effectiveness than to the performance of the principal, him or herself. So to leave with a somewhat unsatisfying but what we believe accurate conclusion, the warning that comes from the research so far. Thank you.
is to think carefully about what value-added measures reveal, contribution of the principle, and use the measures for what they are. They're not um, clear indicators of a principal's contribution to student test scores, rather an indication of student learning in the principal's school compared to the learning that would be expected in a similar context. At least part of this learning is likely due to the principal, and additional measures will be needed to provide further information about the principal's role in that school effectiveness. Thank you. Sorry for the coughing at the end. And I'm happy to hear your thoughts and answer questions about this. Hi. Uh, thanks for that presentation, Susanna, and thanks to you and Jason for the research. Uh, it's clear that the issue of principal evaluation is a challenging one. I will have the opportunity to pose questions to Susanna. Thanks to those who have already submitted questions. For additional questions, please use the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and we'll do our best to get through them all. So uh, we'll start with a question applying the concept of domain of control to teachers. Uh, and the question is, isn't the domain of control problem, that is principles that have control over all the factors that lead to student outcomes, also relevant for teachers? Or is this more of a problem for principal evaluation? My, my impression of this is yes to both of those questions. I think it is also a issue for teachers, but I actually think it's a greater issue for principals uh, because the, the teachers have the students actually in their classroom, and you are really comparing. You're, you're better able to compare teachers who are serving similar students and have likely similar issues that come up. Uh, so by comparing uh, classrooms that are really quite similar in the characteristics of students, you're, you're able to adjust for some of those things outside of the teacher's control in a way that we have a much more difficult uh, time doing for principals. Thank you. Um, so you described the correlations between principal value added and other measures. I did mention that we don't have great measures, but what other instruments for principal evaluation have you reviewed? And the validity and what, what do validity and reliability of those measures look like? Yeah. So, so that's a very good question. And really, the, the ones that, that we reviewed and the, are the ones that are available on a large scale, because these are kind of large scale measures. So there are things like we surveyed principals uh, and had them assess themselves. We, we surveyed all the assistant principals and had them assess their principal, and then the district does their own evaluation. None of these are very well tested for validity, uh, largely because we don't really know what they would be tested against, but haven't been tested that way. There are certainly measures. Uh, there's the Vanderbilt um, measure valid of principles. I, I'm not sure to what extent that has been validated, but that's a kind of more careful measure. I think really it's quite similar or maybe even worse than in, in the teacher value added where we've put a lot of research into trying to understand the properties of the value added from measures for teachers. But these other measures, we have much less strong um, assessments of their reliability or validity. So it's a very good question. And my, my answer is really that we've looked at a range of, of different measures, none of which have very uh, well assessed properties. And the same is true for surveys of the school community, parent surveys, and school culture assessments? That's right. The, um, the MET studies done a little between teachers and student surveys, but I don't know. Um, most of the climate surveys that districts put in, and I don't believe, have, um, have strong studies of their uh, validity or reliability. And some of them don't have great response rates either. Mm -hmm. the, the data available is, is not very good. Now, the, the district's assessments of principles, I should have greater uh, detail on. And I know those are beginning to get uh, more formalized. There's a lot to learn about the other measures as well. Uh, we have a question that steps back a bit. Um, Ask about that we might learn from other industries. 
industries. There are lessons we could draw from other industries or professions on supervisor evaluation. Do other industries use value-added type evaluations in this way? I think that's that's a very good question, and I think there is a wide variety. I, I I'm not an expert in that, but I did in reading this try to read what was there as well. Um, and, um, so there's a wide variety of different evaluations used in many industries. You're not using um, value added measures for the vast majority of staff because it's hard to tie individuals to. Out Outcomes, but for managers of organizations, sometimes the things like um, view of an organization is part of the evaluation, and that too is very much only partially in control of that uh, leader who's being assessed by, by really the performance of the firm. It's very clear that it's the performance of the firm and not necessarily the performance of the leader, but they're still evaluated on it. Um, and I'm. Uh, it, it's a good question about why that is, even though it's imperfect. And I think one of the reasons is because we don't have perfect measures, and another is because it provides some signal of the importance for the job of this measure, even if we know that it's not the only thing you want to be evaluated on because it's not a perfect measure, and it's a pretty, it's a very imperfect measure of how good a job you are actually doing. Hmm. We have a question on the, the strength of that signal. Um, so when you're controlling for variables that, uh, to, that a principal has some degree of control over, you're also collecting a uh, degree of error. So how confident are you that we can isolate principal effect from error? Are we just controlling, collecting error measures and calling it value added? Yeah, no, that's that's a very good question. So my conclusion from for for the data that I've looked at on improvement in schools over time, we are largely now those principles turn over quite a bit. So in general, in many large urban areas, about 25% of turn of teach of principals turn over each year from a school, and when you have turnover over such a long period of uh, so regularly, your your measures of improvement come over very short periods of time, and um, my sense of that is that there is too much noise in there to capture real um, effectiveness by measuring school improvement. It's just too noisy. And if we had multiple outcome measures and we could somehow combine them, maybe we could get rid of some of the noise, but on just the test performance measures, it seems to me that there is too much error there to take it seriously. On the other side, I don't think there's too much error in the school effectiveness. I think we can get some sense of the school effectiveness while the principal is there, but then you're dealing with the bias and the issue of how much of that is really in control of the principal. Mm -hmm. There's some important trade-offs there. Um, we have a suggestion about a force approach to principal evaluation. So uh, it seems like you could get around the small comparison set a plum and approach to by comparing principals who serve smaller schools. What are your thoughts on this? So I think actually the school effectiveness approach, that's really what it's trying to do. So it's it's comparing schools by controlling for things like the characteristics of the kids. So it really is, it's not the average gain of the kids. It's really the average gain relative to what you would predict it would be given who the kids are. And you could also have things like the, the size of the the school. So that first approach really is comparing it to, to somewhat similar schools. Um, if there were ways of identifying schools other than things like the characteristics of the students that the the institution had, that, that the, the, the district, for example, had that they could use to say, well, we think these schools are similar. Let's just compare among those schools. That would be a nice um, alternative. I just had the the very generic kinds of characteristics of the schools in which to, to try to equate them. Hmm. So topic of different kinds of schools, we have a question about levels. Uh, what does research say about using value added for principal evaluation in primary schools? 
schools versus secondary schools? Are there important differences that we should be aware of? I don't think actually that the research is quite there yet. There's clearly some research that shows that the job of the principal is very different, those two different kinds of schools. The um, usefulness of value added in those, whether value added is more useful in one situation than another is um, is difficult to to. To say, I don't think the research. I don't think there's a research base on that. The research base is basically saying that it's a very different job, and so it gets into well, maybe an approach that is useful in one is not as useful in another if the jobs are different. Um, so I think that's that's a very uh, important consideration. Mm. Uh, so you have a question here about uh, just on the topic about how the job might be different. Uh, so, different school models engine different rules for a principal uh, with different relationships between principals, staff, and students. For instance, different schools or CMOs might see a principal as an instructional leader or as a CEO, as a disciplinarian or a community relations person, um, and therefore the, the role of the principal will differ. Uh, how does this affect the, uh, the validity and reliability of value added for principal evaluation? I think that's a nice thing to think about. My first inclination is that it doesn't that that itself isn't a reason that we should have a different approach because even I mean it, as to an extent, it depends on whether that's what the principal chose to do or that's what they were forced to do. So if the only levers that they have available to them is discipline, then we would very much not think that we should hold them responsible for all of these other kinds of things in a school. But if a principal chooses this kind of approach versus another kind of approach, so in, in one they could really be the the direct instructional leader and the other, they could spend more time thinking about structures in the school that help to support instruction. Um, everybody's an instructional leader. Everybody wants the schools to how improve in uh, in the experiences of their students. Um, I think if the, the principal is making that choice, then that choice should um, then it doesn't uh, really matter in terms of assessing them. It's a question of if they're doing it well or not. Um, let's see here. We have a question about the mechanism of, of the principal effect. Uh, so, as, as said in your presentation, uh, we would expect principals who have different um, time bearing effects. So, 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 some principals have more short term effects on student outcomes, and others have long term effects based on the school management style and what they choose to do. Um, how can value, or I guess more generally, a principal evaluation system account for these potentially varying effects? And I think that these are really good questions and ones that we still have to struggle with. My guess is that it will have to do with, with using multiple measures. And um, so you have a print, the, the view added to student learning, which is really the, just if we take that simple uh, model, that could be um, uh, that could be a measure of school effectiveness, which want to attribute a little bit to principals, but to other things as well. But then some things are much easier to affect in the short run than um, than uh, student learning, for example. Attendance is easier to affect. Uh, satisfaction is easier to affect. The retention of of able staff is easier to affect in the beginning. It just it may take a while for these other uh, reforms to come through, or the changes that principals make to come through. So I think that if you have multiple approaches, that's that's uh, one way of having uh, of trying to get at this. And I think this comes back to you know with teachers often one of the benefits of value added is you have so many teachers that you can't know each one effects perfectly uh, in a way that's kind of consistent across the district because you just can't go in and see that many. But 
principles actually may be able to be a little bit more subtle in the valuation using multiple measures and really better understanding the context that they face and the approaches that they face and hold them responsible for kinds of goals that you set together and those kinds of things. So um, even in those situations, knowing how effective the school is while they're there is going to be useful for those evaluations, but it may not be useful to have some kind of formula that applies equally to everybody. Hmm. Thank you. Um, on this next question, seems to be an awareness that we should only pair printing under similar conditions, but don't principals in the same districts control the same things, uh, funding, curriculum, class size, et cetera? If so, could we compare principals to their counterparts in the same district? So I think, yes, that's true. Um, it's, so it's in some ways easier to compare within a district than between districts. The, the ways that their jobs could be different is if you're a principal and you come into a school and one school has a very highly functioning um, faculty and the other school school doesn't. And, um, and for one reason or another, that's just the school that you inherit. How much should you be held responsible? I mean, certainly if you're there for 10 years, you should be held responsible. But in your first year, if all with the less effective faculty um, or the faculty with lots of strife, um, that just might be a more difficult place to get the same kind of school effect even if you do have this uh, similar control. So let's say you're, you're able to hire everybody that you want, but you can't, you can't really get rid of anybody you don't want to, then um, in some ways, in theory, you have the same abilities, but in practice, you really don't because you're, you, you start at such a different place. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe we're some for uh, years of data to apply to uh, teacher wide is at least two, preferably three. Uh, how many years of data would you recommend using to apply you added to principal? Good question. Well, <laughs> at this point, I'm kind of concluding that we can't get very much about the the actual principal effect from mm. um, from value added, like really articulate making sure that you've got an accurate picture of that. So I actually think that any information on how well a, a school is doing is useful. It just can't be only source of information that you use to evaluate a principal. It's just much, it, it needs to be evaluated in context. Two years, of course, is always better than one. Three, I would actually use a similar rule of thumb for principals. They certainly have more students, um, mm. but they also than than teachers do. But our ability to adjust is much less, and so having uh, schools actually sometimes are are more unstable than uh, teach value added for for some reason. Oh, interesting. Um, you may have just answered this, but uh, this this gets to this concept of the principal's role um, in test scores being indirect. So you 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 mentioned that much much of the principal's effect on test scores may be indirect. So why would we use value added under this assumption? Should we consider only those direct measures of principal effectiveness? What is the case for using the indirect measure of principal effectiveness? Oh, I I think that in some ways. It's uh, it's that, that question I I would actually give as a similar approach to teachers maybe in that what teachers do I'm calling it direct well relative to what principals do because the teachers are act, interacting directly with the students but if we looked at it kind of conceptually they're just giving instruction and it's what, what the students are actively taking from that that makes the students learn or not right that that learning is an active process so why not evaluate the teachers on what they do instead of what happens to the kids and I think there's something valid about that one it helps teachers know what to do better um, but but there are good things about using test performance because that that's an outcome that we really care about and and we really value um, instruction for itself 
I mean, it's going to come off. Maybe that doesn't sound quite right. Uh, but the the value that we have about instruction is all the good that it does for students. It doesn't have to be test score good. It could be other kinds of good. But it isn't that we care about the instruction itself. We care about these these benefits for students. And so that's why we want to measure that, because we don't know exactly the processes we should be doing to get those benefits for students. And I think that same um, notion applies for principals in that, yes, it's good to look at attendance, and it's good to look at culture and all these other things. But in the end, it's really the, the uh, outcomes for kids that we care about. And so having some link to that, both to signal the importance of students flourishing and to, um, and to maybe see the extent to which, even, even if it's imperfect, the extent to which we think the principal or teacher might be affecting the student, I think is worthwhile uh, for thinking about an evaluation. Hmm. That's right. And in, in your presentation as well, that we should measure what we care about and if we care about what we care about is student outcomes, and we should have um, a measure for it, even if it's imperfect. Yeah. Um, we have a question about uh, student learning objectives, which are becoming uh, more prevalent. Has any research been done around using student learning objectives in principal evaluation? Actually, not that I know of. And <laughs> far less has been done for teachers as well, I think, uh, than, than we would like. Uh, I think it's a, I was just talking to someone today about how important it is to try to understand that better for all sorts of uh, school improvement reasons. Okay, and um, I think this takes us to our um, our last question. Uh, and it's on principal effect over time. Uh, we use current year test scores to calculate teacher value added because teachers mostly have kids for only one year. But a principal will have an effect over multiple years on the same student, as long as the student and principal are in the same school. Why then wouldn't we use an aggregate measure of test scores over that entire time period? to evaluate the principal. That's right. So I think that if you have a principal who is with a student for multiple years, that it is better not just to look at it in that one year. Um, so I agree that, that that's how it would be it would be useful to do it. The, the trick is that it would mean that for each principal, you would have to have a different equation for kind of estimating their effects. We did... Uh, in the in the paper that we did, the, the Jane and Demi Calagridis and I I worked on relative to this, um, or in relation to this, we did try a measure that didn't have that it really just controlled for the first test score that we saw of a student. So let's say it's high school, we could look at what their performance was coming in and see how much they gained while we're with the principal. And you could do something like that, but it's it's a complicated approach because principal for and how long they're with each student. Um, so we, I, I didn't talk about that here, but I actually think that's a very good uh, alternative. It didn't turn out to be that much different in practice in the one example we did, uh, which is why I didn't emphasize it here, but it, it, that's a nice question. Um, so I said that would be our last question, but we have one more um, to close. Um, and it's a question of kind of projecting into the future. Where do you see the this field going. So I wonder when you first started out doing some teacher value added research, I don't you may not have anticipated that it would have reached the scale that it's reached in policy and practice today. Um, how quickly is value added for principal evaluation moving? Where do you see it going? That's, that is a really good question. So I mean I think one thing that um and we're going to have a, a new brief that talks about this kind of stuff a little bit, because for both for teach, teachers and for principals, so this was a nice lead into that. I think that um, one use of of these uh, evaluations are not actually to to evaluate and judge principals, but to understand what's working. So if you can see a group of principals who receive this training seem to have greater growth in the school or something like that. The problem that we've seen with the growth measure, for example, is that for an individual principal, it has so much error. But maybe if we looked at groups of principals who experienced something, we could learn about it. So I think one place that it's going is as a tool for learning about programs and approaches that work rather than evaluation. Um, 
another place where where it's going is in more um, more combination with other measures. So when do you, how do you use this? I think at least for research, what research needs to figure out is not so much whether it's inaccurate and biased, in what cases can you use it in a way that improves what goes on in practice versus uh, is detrimental. You could have a very accurate measure that is just really uh, a bad mm -hmm. thing to use because it leads to comp some kind of unwanted competition or lack of collaboration. Well, there could be one that is imperfect that can actually lead to benefits if used well. So I think at least for kind of where my world is going, uh, it is in trying to understand how to use all the different kinds of information we have available to benefit HR decisions and to improve, um, you know, schooling. Thank you. So I that the team principal evaluation efforts will lead to uh, greater improvements in student learning. So once again, um, I guess we'll close by saying thank you to Susanna for being with us today, responding to questions and sharing those key findings from your Carnegie Knowledge Brief. And Thanks to all of you listening in. We will post the slide and audio of Susanna's presentation as well as a transcript of the Q&A shortly. Next on the CKN, we will release a brief by Doug Harris on what should we consider when using multiple measures for teacher accountability. On that, that will be released Monday, October 21st, and Doug will present a webinar on that topic on Friday, November 1st. So you should be taken to the registration page for that webinar immediately after the conclusion of this webinar. And we look forward to having all of you participate in that event as well. So until then, thanks again, Susanna. Have a great afternoon. Thanks again, everyone.